Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to uh, uh, the final uh, parts of our annual conference for the, the Hague Programme for Cybernorms. Um, last keynote speaker uh, for this conference, and after that I will do a few concluding remarks, and then that wraps up our annual three-day conference. Uh, thank you all for bearing with us. Um, uh, today, uh, last keynote, uh, Bruce Schneier, uh, a man who hardly needs an introduction, which is invariably followed by someone doing an introduction, uh, so I will give you a little bit. Um, he is a very renowned uh, security technologist, wrote lots of books. One of them uh, is, I think, on the foundation of his talk uh, here today um, called uh, Click Here to Kill Everybody. Um, his Schneier blog is uh, is well read by uh, by many, including by myself, and he's affiliated to both the Bertman Klein Center and uh, the Harvard Kennedy School uh, at Harvard University. Um, he's going to talk to us today about uh, securing a world of physically capable computers. There's an abstract on the website, but there was two sentences that I would like to lift out of the abstract because they really trigger me. It says, okay, soon we will no longer have a choice between government regulation and no government regulation. Our choice will be between smart government regulation and stupid government regulation. Um, I really hope he's going to shed some light on that. Um, looking forward to this uh, a lot. A few uh, minor uh, rules of the road, the veterans of this conference sort of know by now. You can ask questions uh, to the speaker by using uh, uh, the, all the way on the right hand side uh, in, the, in the banner in your screen. There is uh, two text balloons with question marks in it. This is where you can sort of put in your questions in the chat. Please be sure to mention your name because we will be screening them and will not posting uh, anonymous questions and keep it short and sweet, make it uh, succinct. Um, also, uh, for those of you who want to follow us on Twitter, here is the handle. And for those of you who want to spread around sort of what is happening in this space uh, in the couple of the last days, please use the hashtag CyberNorms2020. Um, with that, I am going to uh, hand over to uh, Bruce Schneier. Uh, very welcome, very glad uh, that you're here with us. And the floor is yours, Bruce. Hey there, good afternoon or good morning where I am. Uh, <laughs> thanks for thanks for putting up with our Zoom world. I, I wish we could do these conferences in person. Hope we can again. I truly miss traveling and I truly miss everybody. So thank you. And now it's the end of a, of a long conference. So I'll try to be brief and entertaining. So we're living in a world where everything is a computer. And I think this is important. And this is not a phone. This is a small computer that happens to make phone calls. And similarly, your refrigerator is a computer that keeps things cold, and your microwave oven is a computer that makes things hot. And an ATM machine is a computer with money inside. Your car is a computer with four wheels and an engine. Actually, it's a 100 plus computer distributed system with four wheels and an engine. Uh, this is more than the internet. It's actually more than the internet of things. It's this immersive world of computing. And it means a couple of things. And it means internet security becomes everything security. And all the lessons from our world will become broadly applicable to everything everywhere. So I want to start by giving six lessons of why computers are still hard to secure. Some of these are old, some of these are new, but I want you to think about them in terms of everything everywhere. So one, uh, most software is poorly written and insecure. Right, we know this. The reason is basic economics. We don't want to pay for quality software. Good, fast, cheap, pick any two. We tend to choose fast and cheap over good. Now, poor software is full of bugs, and some of those bugs are security vulnerabilities. Two, we never design the internet with security in mind. Now, this seems crazy when I say it today, but in the early days of the internet, there were two things true. One, it wasn't used for anything important ever. And two, you had to have organizational access to get to it in the first place. For those two reasons, there was a conscious decision to ignore security and leave it to the endpoints. Right? If, if you wanted an app with the security, you'd build it in. And we're still living with the effects of that decision. In the domain name system, in routing and packet security, email addresses, on and on. The third lesson is extensibility. The extensibility of computerized systems means anything you can be used against us. Now, extensibility is a property of computers that other things don't have. It means you can't constrain the functionality of a computerized device because it runs software. 
When I was a kid, I had a phone at home, big black thing attached to the wall with a cord. Great device. It couldn't be anything other than a phone. That's all it did. This is a computer that makes phone calls. It can do whatever you want. Now, a continuously evolving system like this is hard to secure right? because designers can't anticipate every user condition or every software interaction. Right? You can upgrade this with additional features, and these can add in securities. And that upgrade can be used by attackers. You drop malware on this phone, you're adding new features. I didn't want them. I didn't ask for them. But it's the extensibility of computerized systems means that refrigerators can send spam. And cameras can be used in DDoS attacks because they're extensible. Fourth lesson is complexity. The complexity of computerized systems means attack is easier than defense. This is true in general. Complexity is the worst enemy of security for a whole bunch of reasons. An attacker just has to find one unsecured avenue of attack. Defender needs to secure every possible attack. More complex system, larger attack surface. But basically, it is easier to attack than to defend, and testing security is hard because of complexity. Fifth lesson is related is that there are new vulnerabilities and in interconnections. The more we connect things to each other, the more vulnerabilities in one thing affect another thing. So right, 2016, the Dyn botnet, vulnerabilities in DVRs and CCTV cameras allowed hackers to launch a massive DDoS attack against a domain name server, which dropped a bunch of popular websites. In 2018, there was a Las Vegas casino had their payments network hacked through a vulnerability in their internet connected fish tank. Right? And that's the interconnections. And these vulnerabilities can be hard to fix because no one system might actually be at fault. We can see insecure interactions of two individually secure systems. We saw one in PGP a few years ago. There was an interaction between the email addresses uh, that Google and Netflix processed them. No one's at fault, but there's insecurity. The sixth lesson is that attacks always get easier, better, and faster. Some of this is Moore's law, computers get faster. What was a secure password 10 years ago might be insecure today, not because we are better and smarter at password guessing, we're just faster at it. But we do get better and smarter. We do adapt, attackers adapt. The notion of programming Satan's computer, right? It's not Murphy's law, but it's an adaptive, intelligent, malicious adversary. And you can see arms races in uh, spam versus anti-spam, deep fakes versus deep fake detection, ATM machines versus ATM fraud. And expertise flows downhill. What's today's top secret NSA program becomes tomorrow's PhD thesis and the next day's hackers tools. Now, this isn't new. And up to now, this has all been a manageable problem. But for a confluence of reasons, we're, re we're reaching a crisis. And I look at autonomy, automation, and physical agency as bringing new dangers. Traditionally, in computer security, we tend to be concerned with confidentiality. There's the, uh, there's the CIA triad, but confidentiality is, tends to be what we focus on. Privacy, data theft, data misuse. So that's Equifax, the Target hack, OPM hack, Facebook or Cambridge Analytica. Right? Someone got some data and is doing something with it. But the threats come in many forms. DDoS attacks, ransomware, they're both availability threats. I hack into a bank and manipulate bank balance, that's a data integrity attack. But today, the integrity and availability threats are much worse than the confidentiality threats. Their effects are greater, there are real risks to life and property. So yes, I'm concerned if someone hacks a hospital and steals my confidential medical records. But I'm much more concerned if they change my blood type, right? a data integrity attack. And I'm concerned if someone hacks my car and eavesdrops on the conversations I have through the Bluetooth system, but I'm much more concerned if they remotely disable the brakes, right? a data availability attack. So cars, medical devices, drones, weapon systems, thermostats, power plants, smart city, anything. Right? So we're worried about. DDoS attacks against the electrical grid.
ransomware against your car. There's a fundamental difference between your computer crashes and you lose your spreadsheet data and your pacemaker crashes and you lose your life. And it could be the exact same CPU and operating system and application software and vulnerability and attack tool and attack. The only thing different is what the computer is attached to and what it can do. And these trends become more dangerous as our systems become more critical. So I have a seventh lesson that computers fail differently. They all work perfectly until one day when none of them do. Right, so you know, think about this uh, in terms of uh, crashing all the cars or shutting down all the power plants. Right? We have to worry about that because of the way computers fail. At the same time, some of our long-standing security systems are failing. We talk about three of them. The first one is patching. Right? Patching is how we get security. The reasons our computers and phones are as secure as they are, there are two reasons. One, engineers at Microsoft, Apple, etc., do their best to design them secure in the first place. And two, those engineers are able to quickly and effectively deliver security patches when someone discovers a vulnerability. This just isn't true for low-cost embedded systems like DVRs and home routers. They're built at a much lower profit margin, often offshore by third parties. There just aren't security teams associated with those devices. Even worse, many of these devices have no way to patch their software or firmware. And right now, the way you patch your home router is you throw it away and buy a new one. That's the mechanism. There isn't another one. But we do also get security from the fact that we replace our computers and phones every couple of years. And that's not true for embedded systems. You replace your video recorder, what, every five to 10 years? Your refrigerator every 25 years? I bought a new thermostat a couple of years ago. I expect to replace it approximately never. And this is important. Right? Imagine you buy a car today. All right, let's say it was, because uh, software is a couple of years old, and you drive it for, uh, for 10 years and sell it. But I sell it to somebody else. They buy it, drive for 10 years. They sell it. That point is probably bought, put in a boat, sent to, I don't know, somewhere in Africa, uh, if you're in Europe, somewhere in South America, if you're here in the United States. Someone else buys it. They drive another 10 to 20 years. All right. You go find a computer from 1978. Try to boot it up. Try to secure it. Right? There's a reason Microsoft and Apple depreciate their operating systems after a few generations. We have no idea how to maintain 40-year-old software at the consumer level. Having a clue. Right? The problem is even worse for low-cost consumer devices. Companies will be out of business. Product lines will be discontinued. Right? The market's not going to fix this because of the point of purchase, neither the buyer nor seller care. Second thing is authentication. It's starting to fail pretty badly. Human memorizable passwords no longer work in a lot of applications. Two-factor isn't suitable for a lot of situations. Backup authentication is terrible. And the amount of authenticating is about to explode exponentially. So when you authenticate, it's one of two things. I'm going to demonstrate both of them. I right, had one, all right, this is me. I, I authenticated to my phone with my thumb and I checked my email. I authenticated to a remote email server. All right, so that's people authenticating to things, people authenticating to remote services. What we are gonna see the rise of is things authenticating to things. The internet of things is not about you interacting with things. It's things talking to things behind your back. And right. if you have 100 IoT devices that you authenticate to each other, that's 10,000 authentications. You have 1,000, that's a million. We don't know how to do that at scale. We can do it a little bit, Bluetooth, right? but you have to be there to set it up. That doesn't scale. We have a system. Right? My phone is basically my centralized IoT controller. It doesn't scale. We don't know how to do this. Third thing that's failing is supply chain security. And that's insurmountably hard. I mean, right now in the United States, it's all about uh, Huawei, ZTE, Chinese networking equipment. A couple of years ago, it was about Kaspersky, Russian antivirus equipment. This isn't just the US, 2014, China banned Kaspersky and Symantec. 
2017, India banned about 40 uh, Chinese smartphone apps. Uh, 2008, uh, there was a Mujahideen Secrets is a uh, Islamic encryption program because they didn't trust Western encryption programs. Back in 1997, the United States, we had conversations about Checkpoint. Can we trust an Israeli security company? Now, this is just the beginning of the problem, and it's an important question. Can you trust a product made in a company whose government you don't trust? In a company, in a country whose government you don't trust. But there's a lot more. This is a U.S. product, but it's not made in the U.S. Its chips aren't fabbed in the U.S. Its software is written in uh, all over the world. Its programmers have hundreds of different passports. And any one of those things can subvert the security here. We have found backdoors and Juniper firewalls, D-Link routers. And there's more. You have to trust the distribution mechanism. I think of fake apps in the Google Play Store. You have to trust the update mechanism. Not Petya was distributed through a fake update of a Ukrainian accounting package. You have to trust your shipping mechanism. Right? Remember that photo from the Snowden documents of the NSA installing backdoors into Cisco equipment destined for the Syrian telephone company? You can hack a smartphone through a malicious replacement screen. Right? You can't trust anyone. You, you have to trust everyone. And there's no better answer than this. So this is the perfect storm. Right? Security is failing just as everything has become connected. And we've been OK with an unregulated tech space because it didn't matter. And that's no longer sustainable. Primarily, this is a policy problem. Getting the policy right is critical. And law and tech have to work together. To me, this is the most important Edward lesson from Edward Snowden. And uh, I mentioned in the introduction, I just finished a book that speaks to the security policy here with the great title of Click Here to Kill Everybody. And I talk about standards, regulations, liabilities, international treaties and agreements. And I want to pull out two principles, one policy, one tech. Policy principle is this, defense must dominate. Right? One world, one network, one answer. Gone are the days when we can defend our stuff and attack their stuff because everyone uses the same stuff. So either security for everyone or security for no one. Either everyone gets to spy or no one gets to spy. Now you build this with a back door, the good guys and the bad guys can use it. Now you build uh, cell phone systems without authentication and IMSI trackers can be used to uh, track people using phones either by the police or by criminals. And in a world where these devices are used by every elected official and CEO and police officer and judge and nuclear power plant operator and election judge, election official, we must design these for security and not for surveillance. Defense has to dominate. It's too important. So one tech principle, uh, build in resilience. Right? Assume insecurity and design systems that work anyway. And we know how to do this, defense in depth, compartmentalization, avoiding single points of failure, fail safe, fail secure, removing functionality. The real question to me is how to get from here to there. Right? Markets can't solve this. Markets are short-term, profit-motivated at the expense of society. They can't solve collective action problems. And government is the entity we use to solve problems like this. Right? Government is how we act collectively as citizens and not individually as consumers. Of course, there's going to be problems. It's hard for governments to be proactive. Regulatory capture, a big problem in the US. And the real problem of security versus safety. I mean, how do you deal with an adaptive human adversary versus a static safety environment? It's actually a lot harder. And how to regulate security in this fast moving technological environment. The devil is in the details. I don't have them, but the alternative is not viable any longer. Right? Governments will get involved regardless. The risks are too great. The stakes are too high. Government is already involved in physical systems, cars, planes, consumer goods. IoT is similarly physical. 
I normally give this talk to American audiences where I mean, I'm really hitting a vaguely libertarian audience who really balks at government involvement. Right? The EU to me is much friendlier here and, and, and in my belief, a lot smarter. And what I tell the American audiences is what you heard in the intro. The choice is not no longer between government involvement and no government involvement. It's between smart government involvement and stupid government involvement. So we need to start thinking about this as techies so we're not surprised. And I see regulation as incenting private industry. What you hear in the U.S. constantly is that regulation will stifle innovation. And we hear it all the time. There's no real evidence. But you do this right and it spurs innovation. Because regulating outcomes incents companies to purchase these outcomes, which incents companies to innovate tech to achieve them. I see Europe taking the lead on this. I will say that Europe is the regulatory superpower on the planet. A GDPR is a great example. Uh, more safety regulations coming on online. In the U.S., some of the states are leading the way. California, New York, Massachusetts specifically. Right? California has a data privacy law modeled at the GDPR. California has an IoT security law. So we're seeing some movement there. Existing federal regulatory agencies are getting involved. U.S., Europe, other countries. And the international considerations are interesting here. And the car I buy in the U.S. is not the same car I buy in Mexico. Environmental regulations are different, and the company, the auto manufacturers, tune their engines to the local laws. But the Facebook I get in the U.S. is exactly the same Facebook I get in Mexico. Software is right once, sell everywhere. So California has an IoT security law came into enforce. I think it's coming into enforce in January. One of the provisions is no default passwords. Right? It's a minor thing. It's important. But you imagine a company that makes a thermostat or a toy or an appliance. They remove the default password to conform with California law. They're not going to maintain two software builds, one for California, one for the rest of us. We will all benefit. It's the same reason that I benefit from GDPR, even though I am not a European. Smart regulations in a few large markets improve security everywhere because of the way software works. Again, I don't see any alternatives. There is an industry in the past 150 years that has improved safety or security without being forced to by government. Cars, planes, pharmaceuticals, food production, medical devices, restaurants, consumer goods, workplace conditions, financial products. This is how we get increased safety and security. You know, right now, I want technolog technologists to get involved in policy. As Internet security becomes everything is security, Internet security technology becomes more important to overall security policy. All the security policy issues we have have strong technological components. And we'll never get the policy right if policymakers get the technology wrong. You see that in the going dark debate, the vulnerability equities debate, voting machine security, driverless cars, DMCA. I don't know if you watched the Facebook hearings in the United States, but you see, if you did, you saw policymakers with no idea how to regulate technology. Right? We have to fix this. Technologists need to get involved in policy discussions. Congressional staffs, federal agencies, NGOs, part of the press. This is bigger than security. I mean, all of the policy issues of our century have strong tech components. And I'm trying to build a world where there's a viable career path for what I call public interest technologists. Either that or bad policy will happen to us. So thank you. I'm happy to take questions, which I think will be through some chat function which will happen in ways I don't fully understand. But I don't think I have to. Indeed you do not. Um, <clears throat> so far we don't have a lot of questions. Our audience seems to be shyer uh, this afternoon than it has been throughout the conference, but luckily um, uh, there's one question already and there's also uh, a number that uh, resonate with me. Um, I'm going to take privilege and, and start with one of those. Um, 
you said one of the principles is defense must dominate, right? So uh, because everybody uses the same things and we need to design for security, not for surveillance. Um, however, this is this is a space in which states are increasingly treating it as a national security space. There's increasingly espionage, and you mentioned espionage, obviously. So, so the countervailing powers to this principle are huge, especially in times of rising geopolitics. So, so how do you chip away at that uh, at that point? How do you move into this direction? Because that seems like an uphill struggle. So it is an uphill struggle, although we've, we're winning. It, it's very odd. So this notion of going dark, that uh, law enforcement in the US, in Europe, in Australia are pushing for back doors in devices like this because they want to eavesdrop is, is pretty continuous. So I believe there's something coming out of the EU in the next week, which is going to try to block end-to-end -end encryption for things like WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger and another attempt to, to build back doors in, into systems. There's constant push in the United States. You know, it, it is often billed as a security versus privacy issue, and I think that's wrong. Right? It's security versus security. Right? There is security, security value in having these things eavesdroppable. There's also security cost. There's a security benefit in making these secure, even though there's also security cost, which is more important. So it's security versus security, and that's why I lead with defense has to dominate. Yes, right. there is insecurity in the fact that the bad guys can have conversations on a phone that you can't eavesdrop on. But because it's one world, one network, one answer, you can't have right, security for us and insecurity for them. And I just that's what we just have to keep saying. I can't build a system that acts differently depending on the legality of the piece of paper that's next to the system, right? That's not possible. It's a tech system. It doesn't respond to incentives, doesn't respond to, uh, to social things. And, and that's, and you just keep pushing that. And, and yes, it's under assault, but so far we do have security in these systems and it's just going to become more important. Thanks. Um, I have a question from Josh Gold, who is uh, at Citizen Lab in uh, in, uh, in Toronto. You're probably well familiar with that one. Um, here, as IoT devices proliferate and states and others use these as a target for offensive operations, how can norms for state behavior evolve or keep up? Do they have a role to play here? This is sort of the higher level uh, diplomatic debate. Does that have an impact on sort of the questions you relate to here? You know, I, I would love norms to matter. I mean, we kind of we're kind of in a cyberspace with are there are not a lot of norms. So in near term, I just don't see them happening. I would like it if we had norms about what is uh, what is off limits and what can be used. The problem I worry about is there'll always be a group who won't follow the norms, even if it's just non-state actors. Now, in, in the past, norms tended to be enforced by the fact that you needed a certain amount of, of money and authority to, to be affected by them. I mean, if you look out your window, I mean, I can look at my window here, and if I see a tank, I know there's a government involved because only governments can afford tanks. So you can build norms around tanks that only governments would, would have to worry about. But cyberspace isn't like that. You know, if I'm attacked, you know, my phone is, my computer is, my IoT device is, it could be a government, a non-government, a criminal, uh, and uh, some kind of non-government uh, terrorist organization. I have no idea. Right? Everybody uses the same tools, the same tactics, the same techniques. So norms will constrain those who will be constrained by norms, but there'll always be a group that isn't. So I can't rely on them in the way I can for something like nuclear weapons. Right? Or you know whether uh, Red Cross uh, vehicles should be should be fired upon, right? because the range of actors is so different in cyberspace. But is is that a reason? So so you say okay, norms and rules and and all those kinds of things. So they they don't restrain all actors. Um, you could also argue, okay, but maybe there is something to be said for taking each actor in own turn. So so trying to 
Try to yeah. chip away at it. This is a and massive. Is, I, mean, like, I think. I think. I. I'm. In, I want norms. I mean, I want norms about you know surveillance. I mean, I mean, you know, I mean, I was offended like everybody else of the NSA mass surveilling other countries around the planet. You know, and that, and you know, abiding by that norm would would be good for the world. I have a, a different question from uh, Mansour Ahmed uh, Rangers from the University of Cambridge. Um, thanking you for the talk and, and pick up on, on one thing you mentioned in, in the American context, although that is definitely not the only context where this plays, is, okay, how do we avoid regulatory capture by, by private actors? I mean, the, 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 the interests of, uh, of some of the big tech corporations are enormous. Their access is, is very good. And they, uh, so, so Mansoor gives, uh, gives the example of Uber and uh, the Prop 22 victory in California. So how do we go about making regulations? And that sort of also comes back to the policymakers who do not know how to regulate technology. So how do we make sure that regulators regulate in, in terms of the public interest, right? So in, instead of uh, the private corporate interest. So, so what, what segues do we have there? You know, I don't have an answer to that. That's that's a, a bigger problem than me than computer security. And I know that lots of, of smart people have written about this and, and and have ways to minimize regulatory capture. I don't think there's any way to remove it entirely. Uh, and it is it is a worry. I don't think it is a reason not to do anything. Right, zero regulation is worse than a regulatory system that is vulnerable to capture. We have to. Uh, you know, we have to deal with in the United States. It, it's very much a revolving door. Uh, that right, that the expertise to regulate an industry is contained within the industry, and the career path of being government official is just not as interesting. So you don't have as many people staying there. So I, I can hand wave at the solutions. I think we have to think about this and worry about this. But it, it is not an excuse to do nothing. That's the kind of libertarian answer you get. I mean, you don't like, it's sort of like, you don't have a perfect government answer, therefore we're going to do zero. That seems much worse. I mean, and, and, you know, Europe, I think, does better than the U.S. in avoiding regulatory capture. Yeah, we could have a separate debate about that, but yeah. <laughs> but, um, uh, a question from Clive Walker, and, and that's interesting. So, so he's saying, yeah, of course, we want security. Um, and, and the state can help or, or uh, it may be unavoidable, but the worry is that the status agenda doesn't stop at security. And increasingly we see that uh, this is not a, a, a surprise for, for authoritarian government, but increasingly we see a desire or a perceived need to regulate more and more content, to regulate more and more speech um, uh, and other forms of substantive uh, internet activity. So how can we draw boundaries around where we say, okay, this is where state intervention is, is inevitable and needed, and where should it then stop? Uh, so so how, do we, how do we create the bandwidth? Yeah, you know, I mean, again, this is the work of, of a democracy. This is the work of government to draw those boundaries. You know, I mean, we can sit and debate, you know, we, we, this is hard, you know, because I am more of a technologist. I'm used to systems that work more exactly, more precisely than government. Government is messy. But yes, I, I mean, I, I, I too am worried about, you know, free speech. But, you know, I'm in the United States. The United States tends to be a free speech outlier in the world. So my views are not the same as you'll get in many European countries or, you know, or even, you know, a lot of the world. So it's not only how do we draw the boundaries, but how do you allow different nations to draw their own boundaries in what is inherently a global system. So I think there's a lot of, of issues here. I mean, right, Facebook is, it has a bigger footprint than any government. And the norms they are exporting are, you know, not just U.S. norms, but they're U.S. norms of a certain uh, political bent. So how do we deal with that? Yeah. I mean, these are things we have to deal with. I think, there, I think this is going to be the problems of regulating technology in this global world. Yeah. And we have to figure out how to solve them. I don't have answers, but I, I don't want us to ignore the problem or think that the difficulty means we shouldn't even try. Yeah. That's really my fear. 
No, I want to pick up on 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 sort of the last pick on 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 the the Facebook footprint and and sort of tie it to uh, to a question by James Shires. You're probably familiar with James. Uh, he's now at uh, our institute here. Um, oh, hello. yeah, nice to see you. Come back and you should come back and visit back when people can come back and visit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, um, he's asking, okay, regulation in a few large markets uh, causes changes around the world. So. What about Chinese efforts in regulation of internet standards and similar uh, new regulated su superpower? Because, and I want to tack onto it because we're talking basically about the extraterritorial effect of either legal regimes or just technical innovations or, or policies made by companies. And we're sort of picking and choosing the ones we like, but there is also extraterritorial, uh, uh, potentially extraterritorial effects of regulations elsewhere that we may not like very much. So it works two ways. And I think that's right. And that's actually very interesting to watch it happening, especially China with their Belt and Road Initiative, really exporting really their surveillance architecture to other countries that are, are receptive to receiving it. So yes, I, I think that's really, and, and that will be interesting to watch this battle. I, I sort of see three different uh, loci of power here. Uh, the United States, its systems, its rules, the EU, which is increasingly flexing its power, and then China, which is also flexing and exporting. So we might sort of see the internet split almost into, into three different camps, those that follow the norms and rules of those three groups. So yes, I think this is really interesting to watch this play out on the geopolitical stage. Um, a question from Joe Burton from uh, uh, ULB uh, Waik uh, Waikato, um, sort of pertaining to, I think, your first uh, your first issue about software development. He says, okay, is there a solution to uh, sort of in the domain of the economics around software development? Eh? So is there a way to fix some of the problem by paying more, by, by slowing down the process of, of developing and bringing things to market? Uh, a different kind of checks on software before it can, has access to market. Is is there a possibility there, or is it such a rampant, uh, um, uh, fast world that that's not a possible? I mean, of course it's possible. You're just not going to like the answer. I mean, think of what we do with pharmaceuticals. Watch watch the COVID vaccines. I mean, we're forcing companies to spend an enormous amount of money on safety because the, the, the costs of getting it wrong are so great. So we deliberately slow down innovation. We deliberately make it more expensive. We do that in aircraft design. You know, right, Boeing 737 MAX and regulatory capture aside, the, we, we, we slow down innovation. So, and we, can, we, we have a slider here. You know, we can demand through regulation that companies spend more money on security, on testing, on safety, on design, on audit, on anything we want. You know, and, and maybe you'll get your apps on your phone much slower. Now, we probably don't like that. So we can do all of this if we're willing to accept the costs. The costs in money, maybe the costs that, 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 that the, the questioner mentioned, right? the costs in time and the costs in money. And we do that in other industries because we know it affects life and property. Computers are soon going to affect life and property. And we're going to have to decide if we're going to do the same sort of thing. It's going to, it's going to change the industry enormously. But yeah, I like your example, uh, the example you gave about California and sort of uh, the, the default in terms of passwords and no default passwords. And I think that's one of, that's a really, interesting way of going against the dominant plug and play mode of, of the whole thing and say, no, 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 it's allowed to be a little more complicated than that. And that will it's perhaps- a list. I mean, we're not, we're not yeah. doing much here, right? Yep. This is, you know, right on my top 10 or top 100, we've now checked off one of my boxes. Yeah, exactly. It's something, we're, we're trying to get there, but this is slow and, and that was fought by industry. Yeah. I have a question from, uh, from Brian Stokes from uh, Georgia Tech. Um, Interesting question, sort of relates to your point about, okay, how do we create an environment in academia and beyond that, that fosters this idea of yours of the public interest uh, technologies? 
how, how would you do that? Because uh, he watched the Facebook hearings just like I did, and it was cringe-worthy. Uh, let's put it that way. But also, uh, perhaps in relation to uh, your role uh, at Harvard in the Kennedy School, you are schooling uh, uh, basically the 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 uh, some of the public officials of tomorrow. So so how do you go about that? So I'm trying, right? I teach cybersecurity policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. So these are public policy students, and I mean, my goal isn't to turn them into techies. My goal is to give them a good bullshit detector. My goal is to get them to understand tech and seek out technical advice and believe it when they receive it. So this is already happening. Ford Foundation, New America, are funding the Public Interest Tech University Network, P-I-T-U-N. They have a conference like right now. I'm speaking at it in two hours. And there are 20 or 30 universities that are trying to offer joint degrees in like tech and policy or courses or you know trying to build this bridge between tech and law tech and public policy tech and business to try to make these public interest technologists uh i have a page so i anyone who's interested publicinteresttech.com with hyphens is my page of everything out there i know in public interest tech writings talks university programs, NGOs, government programs. Uh, you know, and so please, I, I recommend, I want everyone to go look there and, and see what's being done. I mean, to me, this is vital. I have an interesting question from uh, from Monica, uh, sorry, from Irina Bress from uh, the University College London. Um, uh, thanking you for the talk, but so okay, you mentioned the need for regulation in order to create a baseline for responsible security. Uh, but she says, okay, and many of the examples you refer to are very much from the space of safety. So have pharma, vehicles, etc. Regulating safety and security are not necessarily the same. Uh, security is very dynamic, uh, multiple interests, etc. And maybe more difficult to regulate with with normal conventional uh, uh, legislative initiatives, uh, like like we said before, the national uh, security versus security, basically, uh, as you phrased it earlier. So how would you respond to that? So we have to figure this out because security and safety are colliding. It's safe, and, you, and you're right, safety is normally this static. Right? I think of it as Murphy's Law, Murphy's Computer. And security is dynamic, intelligent, adaptive, what I call Satan's computer. But now, right, a vulnerability in a car that can cause it to crash is both safety and security. Because these, because these computers affect the world in a direct physical manner. Safety and security are becoming one. Ross Anderson wrote a really good paper on this combination of safety and security. I wish I could just channel what he said, so I'll advise people to, to, to go read it. And, and you're right. The differences are considerable and important, but they are now going to be, they're going to be one and the same. So we need to solve this. Thank you. And that would be uh, Ross Anderson from Cambridge University, I, I presume? Yes, yes, Ross Anderson, um, Cambridge University. Do you, do you happen to know the title of the paper? I don't. I would just type Ross Anderson safety security into Google and hope for the best. And, and hope for the best. That's good. <laughs> we'll rely on Google for that one. Okay. So, uh, I can do uh, it right now and see if it works. No, it's fine. Um, uh, I have a question from uh, Valerio uh, Fiscardi, uh, a recent uh, MA graduate in international security. Um, if large markets can influence the way companies develop software, um, could it also be that large countries with unaligned principles from the Western ones uh, like China can shape the products we use every day and maybe undermining our security? Uh, so this is basically another form of extraterritoriality. Um, so how can we avoid that? And maybe that ties into to a little bit of what you said about supply chain and probably the, the inex inextricability of supply chains as they stand now. It's, it's, can they be disentangled? Should they be disentangled? I don't think it's possible to disentangle them. I mean, you can imagine a US only iPhone, it will cost 10 times as much, no one will buy it. The only country that is even remotely capable of doing it alone is China. Right? India can't, the EU can't, the US can't, nobody else can, nobody else is big enough. So I think we are, are you know, in a just deeply, deeply international in a way that you cannot undo. So yeah, I think you also have to worry about 
big markets like China affecting products and services in the other way. And we do see that. We see U.S. companies uh, doing things about for their systems to uh, appease China, which the rest of the world doesn't like. So, so yes, I think that is a concern. You know, I mean, you'll see it in little things. In the United States, we for decades had a problem with textbooks. The textbooks were written by kind of conservative Republican Texas standards because they were such a big market and, comp- and manufactured book publishers didn't want to have two different textbooks. So everyone else in the world got the same lousy Texas textbooks. It's the same kind of idea. So yeah, I think you have to worry about countries like China. And that's probably the only one that can do it. You saw I mean, a bunch of years ago with uh, Blackberries, countries trying to push Blackberry into making their stuff uh, vulnerable. And Saudi Arabia tried it and I think failed. India tried it and succeeded halfway. It's hard. Facebook is just basically saying no to the EU, which is kind of crazy when you think about it. And it'll be interesting to see how that goes. I have a, a, a nice question that tags nicely onto that. So it's a question by uh, Frederik Zadeveen Borgesius, the University of Nijmegen in the Netherlands. Um, he says, OK, do you have any thoughts on the relationship between how big some technology firms have become and the security and privacy risk that that engenders? So what is the relationship between one and two? Does one make two worse or, or is there a way around it? You know, so I think monopolies definitely make it all worse. Mm. So, you know, monopolies make a lot of things worse. And one of the things they do is they make the companies not beholden to uh, users and customers. So they kind of ignore security and privacy because you can't go anywhere else. So I think breaking up the tech monopolies will solve an enormous number of problems we have. These massive, powerful companies are not doing us any good. So, yes, I think there are security and privacy implications. We would do better with, with smaller companies. Because they would they would be more responsive to the market. But I think the, 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 the reasons to break up the big tech monopolies are much greater than security. OK, and we're going to finish off because we're already running late with with one last. Well, there's many questions open still. So this okay. is what we projected what would happen. But that's not a bad thing per se. Um, uh, a question by Rogier Kramer. So to what extent does uh, what you describe come down to a great normalization? In other words, the tech industry is increasingly, and perhaps hopefully, uh, treated like any other instead of the exceptional status it has held so far. Is that a dis- is that something you see? Uh, I think it is, and I think it's going to happen as the tech industry becomes everything. But you're right; there has been this exceptionalism. They, in the U.S., they're exempt from normal product liability laws, and they're treated as as darlings because of the enormous amount of wealth creation. No one wanted to touch the industry because it just generated so much money for the it benefit the economy so so greatly but yes i mean treating this like a normal industry will will do a lot and i and i hope we will and i think as it normalizes right as tech becomes stops being a separate thing and starts being part of everything we'll get that normalization thank you very much that was uh, that was a great talk it was good questions uh, and answers. thank you uh, and um, I see that uh, Mansour Ahmad Rangers uh, of the University of Cambridge has posted uh, uh, a paper by uh, Ross. Um, apparently, Ross Anderson is his supervisor, so he thinks this is the one. <laughs> so uh, thank you for that. So people who are interested in that paper can pick it and up. And next from, year in person, right? Let's do this in person next year. Let's do this in person. That would be fantastic. Speak thank you very plane. much. Thank you very much for taking uh, taking time for us uh, today. Um, uh, animated conversation. Um, See you uh, hopefully in the real world at some point. All right, and that brings us um, already to um, the last part uh, of our proceedings. Um, It's about uh, this conference we've had um, been together for three days. Uh, normally, uh, we would say, uh, really, we have been together for three days or two days uh, in, in one space, debating each other and continuing those debates uh, during uh, during the breaks, um, uh, during dinner and during drinks, um, which usually tends to heat up the debate even, uh, even further. Um, unfortunately, that was not possible this year. Um, um, I think we were all in the team uh, a little sad about that, but I think 
At the end of this conference, now that it's done, I think we're a little less sad about it. Uh, we'd still prefer the other one, but I think we've had an excellent conference. Uh, we had some really, really good keynotes. We had some really uh, good paper sessions. Actually, all the sessions were well visited. Um, so that's, that's a huge plus uh, for us um, uh, in terms of uh, sort of unlocking uh, the knowledge and the debates that we normally have within uh, four walls in a beautiful 17th century building in The Hague was now unlocked to the world at large uh, for anyone uh, who would like to join. So that is definitely uh, an advantage. Um, we have also been blessed uh, by, by you, the audience. Um, I think we had a very receptive and a very uh, uh, lively audience. We got a lot of good questions. We got a lot of good debates. So we're really happy about that. Um, I always sort of tend to think uh, about conferences, whether I'm happy with it on how many pages I fill in my notebook. And, and by that standard, I think I had a pretty good conference. There's lots of notes in my notebook that I will need to go uh, through. Um, normally, this is also the moment where I would sort of advertise our uh, visiting fellowship program. Um, uh, I think I will advertise it in the abstract and say, OK, um, uh, if you take the idea of the visiting fellowship uh, as something where people reach out to us as a program and want to connect with us as a program, then that's uh, you're very welcome to. As soon as we can reopen uh, uh, the visiting fellowship program, we will. For now, um, uh, you know where to find us, you know our web space, you know uh, the faces uh, that are connected to this program. So please reach out to us if there's things where you want to connect to, to the program or our work. Um, also, traditionally, um, we uh, at the end of each conference, we oh, it's already on the screen. At the end of uh, uh, each conference, we uh, uh, we have a, a best paper award. And even though uh, we can't do it uh, uh, live at this moment, we can't do it in in real uh, space. Um, we want to do it this year too. Um, we're very pleased that uh, um, this, this paper was presented already on the first day in the panel on international cyber order in the making. It was a paper about uh, the negotiation position of, uh, of India and the way uh, uh, India sort of moves at different speeds and with different uh, uh, interest in different spheres. Um, uh, in the economy, perhaps uh, a little faster and more agile than in the national security and sort of setting questions for, OK, how will this position of India, which is uh, a, a regional superpower, uh, how will it translate at some point to uh, to the international? And that was a paper uh, called Will India Negotiate? The Politics of uh, Multilateral uh, Engagement uh, for Fostering Responsible State Behavior in Cyberspace. Uh, by uh, Arin Jahid Basu and Kartik Nachapan. Um, I understand that uh, uh, Arin Jahid is with us. Let's see if we can loop him in. Yeah. Hi, hey. hi, hi, Dennis. Thank you. Hi. Yeah. Welcome. Uh, welcome back. Um, I'm really glad you were, you were able to join us. Uh, your your co-author is in, in Singapore and is probably on one ear by now, um, yeah. given the, given yeah. the time difference. Um, I'm really pleased um, uh, that you uh, uh, you were able to uh, to accept uh, the best paper award. Um, uh, we were really pleased both by the paper, but also by uh, by the really lively debate we had in that panel. Uh, I thought it was uh, it was a wonderful panel. Um, I think also for for a lot of people in this space. We need to know much more about uh, uh, different powers and how they uh, how they negotiate, how they uh, uh, understand their position and, and work with their position. And your paper really uh, uh, contributed to that. So thank you very much for that. Um, do you have uh, any plans for publication? Uh, yeah, I think we got some feedback both at the session and even after we wrote the paper, I think we uh, need to add some stuff. So Karthik mentioned at the panel that we plan to do some more empirical work on it. I think that's that's lacking. So once that's done, we hope to uh, sort of shortlist and, and, and publish. Yeah. That's excellent because we think it's something that should be shared with the world. Um, normally when we uh, give out uh, uh, the, the best paper award, you would now be bathing in the glow and the shine of a warm applause uh, within uh, four walls. So um, I'm, I'm sorry to say that we, we can't arrange that for you. Um, uh, but rest assured, I think all over the world, people are, uh, are applauding your efforts uh, now. Um, uh, the, the prize that is attached to, uh, uh, to our best paper award is, uh, is that 
God willing, if we are able next year to organize a, a conference uh, 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 real uh, here in The Hague, then we would uh, happily uh, uh, invite you and your co-author to come over uh, and, and join the conference. For us, um, um, that would be our pleasure. Um, that is also uh, the prize we gave out last year. So, Julia Sluka, we haven't forgotten you. Uh, <laughs> sadly, you weren't able to join us this year, but we will extend that invitation uh, to Julia as well uh, for, uh, for, for next year because uh, prizes like this do not wither and die. Um, uh, another uh, Best Paper Award winner was, uh, was Monica Kaminska, who by now has been recruited into our, our, our program and works here. So, I'll maybe, I'll, I'm, Perhaps I'll pick her up uh, on my bike uh, and bring her to the conference next year. Um, thank you very much, uh, Andre, for uh, for participating in the conference. Thank you very much for uh, uh, for a wonderful paper, and um, I really hope uh, we will be able to meet each other in person uh, next year here in The Hague. Uh, yeah. Thank you, uh, Dennis, and thanks to everyone I mentioned uh, at The Hague Program for Cybernorms for organizing this in the midst of uh, uh, crazy, some crazy times you're having. So, so thank you very much, and thanks for uh, appreciating our work. All right, you're most welcome. So, with that, I am about to close uh, uh, the conference. And um, there's a few uh, people uh, who I think uh, need to be mentioned. Um, and these people are first and foremost. Um, um, if if anything uh, in this conference has been glitching, it has been uh, our mistake uh, altogether. But the person who has been responsible for making this all work, not only today and yesterday and the day before, but all in the run up to it, is Korean Osterbahn. Everyone who has been speaking um, uh, will know what I mean. Uh, Korean is the person who will see you in and out uh, uh, through everything that we do. Um, we owe a great debt of gratitude to her for making this run as well. So thank you, Korean. Um, I also want to thank uh, uh, the, the moderators who have been uh, helping us out, uh, uh, affiliated with uh, the program. Uh, so Bibi van der Berg, James Shires, uh, uh, Elster Busser, Tatjana uh, Tropina. Um, thank you very much for, uh, for chairing for us. And lastly, I want to uh, uh, thank our, uh, no, not lastly, actually, I want to thank our core team, um, uh, which has been uh, 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 Monica Kaminska, Fabio Cristiano and uh, Corian Osterbahn for, for uh, putting this all on the rails and making sure it works. And lastly, and that is really lastly, I want to thank uh, everyone and each and every one of you out there, the audience and the participating. Um, it's been a joy and a privilege uh, uh, hosting this uh, online. It's been really uh, uh, good fun and really interesting to see all those questions and to see people engage with the debate. Uh, we're very, very grateful for that. Um, thank you for joining us. See you in 2021 and really, really hopefully see you in The Hague in the real life. Thank you very much.